So today I'm going to show you how to make the uh, Rockin Robin bunting with his jingly feet. So we're going to make six of these. You can make as many as you like, um, but six will do you a reasonable little bit of bunting to go across a shelf or something like that. So the first thing you're going to need to find is two circular things to draw round. One needs to be about five uh, centimeters across and then this one probably about eight centimeters across so I've got a little um, one of these miniature jam jars which is going to do the uh, red bit in the middle and then just a, a cup which is going to do the actual body okay you can make templates out of those to draw around if you want or you can just draw straight round these so to make the red bit, I've put some bondaweb on a piece of uh, red fabric and I've actually ironed it rough side down. The rough side is always the bluey side. So the rough side down onto the piece of fabric and then I'm just going to draw around my template six times so that I've got enough red breast to do all of the robins. And then I can cut right up to the edges, which I've done here. So once you get to that bit, you've now got the smooth papery side on the back. If you just take um, a pin or scissors or my seam ripper score down the middle and give it a little wriggle. And then you should have a gap, which will make it nice and easy to peel off the paper. And what you're left with is it will feel a little bit rubbery and that's the glue now so that you can then glue it to the felt ready to sew because it's going to hold it in place so piece of felt and the felt I've cut these squares to be bigger than the circle that I'm going to need because we're going to do that after we've stitched this on so you can now iron that in place on each one of these one thing you do need to remember, felt will melt. If you put a hot iron on this, it will melt onto your iron and uh, nobody's going to be very happy about that, are they? Um, you might be off the Christmas list. So make sure you put something like a piece of baking paper over the top of it just to protect your iron and protect the felt as well. You need a lower temperature, but just to be on the safe side, put a piece of baking paper across it as well. I tend to do that always when I'm using things like Bondaweb because it is glue and if any bits of it are around and about and get on your iron it can make a mess and like I said nobody's going to be very happy about that if you mess up the iron. So once you've done those and like I say if you do six maybe or you can do as many as you want but start with six don't do hundreds because you might get bored after you've done six. So once you've got all those ready to go we're now going to stitch all the way around here and I'm going to use a zigzag stitch so on this machine I've got a choice of a small medium large uh, zigzag and what that means is how wide it is which is how far it swings across here so I'm going to go for the small because this is quite small. So I don't want it to be really, really wide as it goes round. So it's telling me to turn my dial to C, which I have. And then I want to look at the stitch length. Because I'm going round curves, I'm going to take the stitch length much smaller, shorter than I normally would. I'd normally have it on about two and a half um, millimetres so each stitch is that long but I'm going to take it down to about one and a half because it's going to help me it's going to close it up a bit and it's going to help me as I go around this curve so I've got a clear foot on the machine uh, it's the satin stitch foot and this foot has got and I'm going to see if I can bring you in a bit closer so that you can see this foot has got a little um, gap here and I'm going to line that gap up with the edge of my fabric here so that as I go around I'm going to drop the presser foot and I'm going to try and keep the line of the circle that I'm going this fabric here in line with that gap 
So as soon as I lose sight of that, I'm going to stop with my needle down. I'm going to lift the presser foot slightly and rearrange. So I'm going to do, as I go round, you'll see what I mean. And I'm just going to do a few stitches at a time and then change what I'm doing. So only about three or four, but I've started to lose sight. This is now over this side. So what I'm going to do, the needle is already down and it's always good to have the needle down when you do this. I'm just going to lift that presser foot and then just gently move my circle so that now it's back in line here. Do another couple of stitches. And if your needle isn't down, just crank the handle towards you until the needle is in the fabric before you then lift your presser foot and then move it again. If you do it when the needle is up, you'll find that you'll just keep going out of line. So again, my needle hasn't finished down, so I'm going to lower it down so that I can now lift the presser foot and turn. So I'm just doing little sort of jabs, if you like, on the presser foot underneath. If you're lucky and you've got, um, you're using a machine that's got speed control, do this really nice and slow. Okay. So needle down, lift and turn. So I'll do that a few times. And you do need to do it a few times when you're going around a circle because otherwise it won't look very much like a circle. So again, get the needle down before I move it. I'm going to swing it over to the outside, there we go, and move it again. So all I'm doing is just keeping my eye, not on the needle, don't keep your eye on the needle, because then it's like a, a snake charming you, and you'll just be watching the needle and you'll forget to watch where the material is, because you're the one who's actually in charge of how the material goes into the machine. So again, I'm just putting it, and always, always, that wheel at the side towards you because otherwise you're making the stitch go backwards and it's going to confuse the machine and that's when you get that horrible mess underneath because it'll just get caught and confused and it's easy to get confused so I'm nearly there bring it back over and last little bit some machines you won't have a choice of you might not have this second dial for a stitch length so you might not have quite so much choice on the length of the stitch that you can do but it doesn't really matter you just might find that you have to do a lot more sort of lift and turn as you go round. or in a second I'm going to show you another stitch that I use to actually put the little beak on and that's quite a good stitch for um, going round the edges of things like this. So if I show you the back, because I think it's more obvious on the back. There you go, you can see it's actually quite a smooth circle. And that's because I've done lots of that lift and turn, lift and turn, lift and turn. Feels a little bit boring, but you get used to it and then you get a lot quicker and you'll just keep your eye on what's going on. Like I say, it's all about how you feed the material in. Don't watch the needle, watch where the fabric's going. So once we've done that, I'm now going to put a little beak on him. So you could bond a web a piece of yellow fabric and cut it, but to be honest, the beak is so small, you don't really have to worry about that. Um, I've just literally cut a little weirdo beak shape that's quite a big beak for this this size of robin but that's okay some people some robins have big beaks some have small and i'm going to just use a dab of a glue stick because like i say all i want to do is hold this down in place let me come back out so you can see it a little bit better so i've just put a little dab of glue on there not loads, and then it's just going to hold it down long enough for me to sew it. So like I say, if you don't have Bonderweb, you can cut your circles out and just use a glue stick 
to do that. So to sew the little beak on, because it's so small, oh, I'm just going to put a dab more glue on there, because that is so small, rather than use zigzag, which I think is going to be quite tricky to go around something that small, I'm going to use the ordinary straight stitch, but, so that's going to be A on this dial, but what I'm going to do, it's about the stitch length as well. Because this is so small, I'm going to use a really, really small stitch length. So instead of doing 2.5, I'm going to go nearer to 1. Okay, so that's going to do a really tiny stitch. And again, I've got this clear foot on and I just want to come inside. So where that little gap is showing, again, it's on the edge now of the yellow bit of the beak. And then what I'm going to do, and you'll see that it moves a lot slower because it's taking such tiny stitches. So rather than you having to do like three or four stitches and then, oh, quick panic, I've got to turn. Needle down, because I'm at the point of the beak. Lift, swivel it round so I can then come back up the other side. And one more stitch, needle down, there we go, lift and swivel it round so I can then go across the top of the beak. There we go, all done. So lift that up, lift the presser foot up. And I'll just trim those away so I can show you the stitching. So here we go. So can you see it's tiny, tiny stitches. But when you're doing things like this, if you take the stitch length down, it does make it an awful lot easier to do. If you haven't got a zigzag stitch that is working or if you're finding it quite hard to do that, then try just doing this. Take your straight stitch down, make it into a really tiny stitch. And again, you normally have stitch length options. If you don't have this, it will give you a small, medium, large stitch length. OK. So what I can also do is if I wanted to, look, I can just trim away the extra fabric there. So he's got his beak on. So we've done this bit as well. So the next thing to do is I'm going to put another piece of felt behind because if I use two pieces, it's going to make it a little bit stiffer so it's going to hang better. Otherwise, it might be a bit wibbly wobbly. And then I'm going to draw around the bigger circle. And to do that, I'm going to have to use something because it's dark brown that I'm using. I'm going to use Taylor's chalk because it will show up much better. So if I put it here, hopefully you can see what I'm doing. So I'm just going to hold that cup down nice and firm. And then go all the way around Oops. with the tailor's chalk. Hard to fit when you get to the handle, so you might find it easier if you actually cut a cardboard template out for the big one. And then what I've got, oh, I went off the side there, so I'm just gonna do that by hand just to bring that line back in so I can see it. So this is the line that I now want to follow to do the outside edge of my bird. And the stitch that I'm going to use for that is one of the stretch stitches. And let's see if we can see that because it's at the end of the line. It's this one here. So these stretch stitches along the bottom are um, usually used on stretch fabrics because they're normally a sort of zigzaggy based stitch that will stretch with the fabric and come back in. So on this dial here, there is a setting that says SS for stretch stitch. So I need to make sure I'm on that and then these stitches here come into play. And I'm looking for stitch G at the end, which almost looks a bit like um, a blanket stitch. 
so that's quite a nice decorative one and that is stitch G so I'm going to go all the way up to G okay and then I can see where my needle is my needle this time is here so my needles here and I am lining up this bit of chalk with this edge of my foot there's a gap here so I've got this piece of my foot to the um, when you face it to the left hand side okay so as we go around it's going to do a couple of stitches on this chalk line and then it's going to do the little tooth stitch I always think of it as gums and teeth going on to the inside and you'll find with this because of the way this stitch works, the stitch in between, it's going to do it. It's going forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards. So it gives you more time to actually move it in a circle. So I, I don't have to do as many, you know, stop, lift and turn. But again, keep your speed. Just do a little bit at a time. And then if you're a bit unsure, drop your needle down like before and then lift and turn but this time like I say rather than the gap I am keeping it in line with the edge of that inside edge of that foot just test it out on a little scrap piece to start with all of these stitches you know if you test them out you'll see what they're for this stitch is usually the one if I was making a t-shirt for example, or a stretchy headband, this is the stitch that I'd be using to do the seams because it gives you still quite a nice amount of stretch with the fabric. So I'm going to go all the way around. I'm going to take that over to the outside before I lift and turn just to get that back in because we're on the bigger circle like I say it's um, far less of that tiddling around with lift and turn all the time isn't it much easier but it's quite a nice decorative stitch this one and if you haven't got this stitch or if you are struggling with it you can always do this bit by hand with a blanket stitch so there we go I'm right at the end so I can pull him out and then I'm gonna trim up the threads on both sides so there we are he's done this chalk if you just keep rubbing away at it look it just disappears so like i say it's one of the best things to use on dark felt um, maybe an old toothbrush or something like that would get rid of it even quicker but it will it will disappear so the next thing i'm going to do is i'm very carefully going to just cut just outside of my stitching if you've got pinking shears you might want to use pinking shears for this because that can look quite nice but do be careful not to cut over that lovely stitching you've just done so there we go all the way around i'm using quite big scissors here you might find it easier to use a smaller pair of embroidery scissors or just smaller scissors because you've got smaller hands so there we go starting to look like a robin isn't he so we've got the beak on we've got the body oh hang on we've got a spare ooh, spare thread there we go get rid of that and now he just needs some eyes so here in my big pot of many eyes i'm gonna pick out a couple of pet i quite like these are all mixed sizes and sometimes it looks quite nice if you put like this one i've actually put two different size eyes on kind of gives him quite a quirky look so i am just going to put those on with a glue gun so i'm going to put a little dab of glue 
on there and then put the eye on. Don't try doing it on the eye because it's really difficult to hold and not burn your hand. You can get um, cool melt glue guns as well, but even those will still hurt if you do it. There we go. So his eyes are on. So the last thing he needs is his legs. So you can use something like a really narrow ribbon like this, or I've got this nice stripy cord. And what I'm going to do is on the back, I've got a really big needle so I can get that through. And I'm just going to poke this in. It's like um, a, it would probably come under a darning needle. I imagine something that you might put um, knitting together with or something. It's not very sharp at the end, but I've just made a little hole there and a little hole there, but I've only done it through that back layer of felt. And then I can just wriggle it around and pull it through. And then if I take the needle off, that could give him a very long legs, but I think that's far too long. Cut them a little bit longer than you want them because you're going to lose a little bit of this when you tie the bells on. And then you can put your bells on. I know they're here. I can hear them ringing every now and then. Just thread it through the top of your bell. Ooh, come on. Okay. Okay. Don't worry if this gets a bit messy here because tie your knot and then you can trim the messy bit off. And then just going to tie that in a knot. If you're using a glue gun, what is worth doing at this point, and I'm saying this because my grandson has recently debelled some of the robins because he was told not to touch and he did, of course. He's only four, so put a little dab of of glue on there to just stick that end end down okay so that's one and let's put another one on if you haven't got bells the other thing that might look quite nice actually is um pom-poms so bells pom-poms buttons you could use um, buttons for eyes as well if you wanted to oops this cord is nice but what happens is it's all coming apart as it's going through the hole I should have left a needle on probably and then it would go through a bit easier wouldn't it it's like threading a needle but ten times worse there we go and poke it through there we go the um some of the ribbons can be a little bit tricky to do this bit as well but this isn't going well i'm going to trim that off which is what i always have to do if i'm actually threading a needle going to go for a bigger bell with a bigger hole otherwise we'll be here for hours won't we okay ah, success okay so tie that in a knot trim the end off like I say, I'm just going to put a little dab of glue to stop those ends looking a bit messy and to make sure that bell doesn't come off. Okay, so he's all done. So to put him onto um, a ribbon or something like that, um, I'm looking around because I can't find the bit of ribbon I had. I had a bit of ribbon here ready to put them on for the bunting. 
where's that gone well even if i use this again you could use the same method I'm just going to even his legs up with that needle of threading them up so that they were all on here or like i say you can just um, glue them onto a thicker piece of ribbon so like the ribbon that says happy merry christmas or something like that and then your bunting's ready there's a picture of the bunting at the beginning anyway just to show you what you're making so have fun <laughs>